morning friends. Welcome back to Let's Talk Expedition Africa. Well, today I've got a beautiful couple in front of me, Jolene and Chinus Mantaisen from Addicted to Adventure. How are you guys? Hello. Are Hello, you good? <laughs> and how's lockdown going? Oh, it's fun. As we, as we feed together with each other, we, um, we're not locked down alone like some people are split. So we have been. Happy. So uh, please, guys, I would like to tell our friends, this couple do wonderful things. They've been racing forever, for a very long time now, adventure racing. They are even involved in now assisting us with some of our 25k races around Johannesburg and organizing some of the events as well. But over and above that, they have their own like adventure tour company where they organize travels and tours in Africa and also overseas. So Jolene, please tell our friends at home, for those who don't know what you're doing, where did Addicted to Adventure start and what are you doing? Okay, now, well, Tina and myself, we've always been adventurous and did a lot of sport, um, you know, throughout our whole life. We've been together now for what, 20, 20 years already. So yeah, we've, we've, we've done a lot of things together. Um, and obviously married for what 15 15 plus years um yeah always done adventures adventures and then we we got to a point where we decided we want to start a family we want to obviously we, we're both very family orientated um and then after quite a few um years we've actually been informed there's there's no way we're not going to have any children which was quite a big thing for us um it was really emotional we went through quite a tough tough uh, part in our life and then we just decided we got to a point we said okay to sit at home and sulk is not going to work for us anymore let's officially start this adventurous company um let's nurse it as our baby um let's fill our time with things <coughs> that can actually you know fill, fill the void so we started this company doing any adventure from a one day to a weekend to a week until two weeks you know and it's always adventure always taking people with us always loving to empower people coming with us on the tours and we've done this since 2012 so it's been almost eight years already and obviously met amazing people along the way so your next trip is the tiger fishing in zambia or the bali trip what is your next thing yeah so the next one is is tiger fishing um in a private island on the upper zambezi so at this moment we're not too sure if it's going to happen we, I, I think it will probably be moved like we had to move lucidu uh, you guys had to move lucidu expedition um but yeah it's a it's a private island where we tiger fish with the most amazing nature around you hippos um oh, wow. falcons and uh, yeah stuff you don't see in, around here, even in some of our nature's places, as, as if nature's is sort of a bit dead, but there's, everything is alive. And obviously Victoria Falls, which some is one of the um, seven wonders of the world, natural wonders of the world, but we also visit that. So that's the next upcoming one, if it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Oh, wow. Yeah, so so Jenny, is... yeah please, Sorry, also oh, our, the... please also tell our friends at home, um, you know, where they can find out or more information about your tours if there's anybody who would like to join you. Yes, well, we've got a website. It's called Addicted and then the numerical 2 and then adventure.co.za. Um, and then they can go and have a look at our tours. We, we um, our, The other tour that you just mentioned, the Bali one, is our December two-week adventure tour. Oh, wow. So it is literally for two weeks every day you do something adventurous. Um, for example, one of them would be a hike in the middle of the night on an active volcano where you can literally going to see the blue flames, if you want to call it, at night. And then you'll arrive on the top at, at, at sunrise. Um, then obviously a lot of river rafting. We're going to visit some locals. We're going to make uh, doing some cooking lessons oh. for the locals. All that type of thing. So every day there's another adventure that's part of the tour. So let's hold thumbs that December we'll be able to do that because that tour is already fully booked. Um, but yeah, it's going to be an amazing tour. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Wow, guys. So that's super awesome for anybody at home. Now you know. We're contact if you want to do some adventure trip and you may be not 
a person who would like to do a full-on expedition race, but you would like to be with adventure racing people or uh, outdoor people and just want to go and do exciting stuff, you can join this couple and all their wonderful tours. Um, but let's uh, tell our friends where did this wonderful story of adventure racing start? Now, what I maybe you can give me another picture, but but what I've got in my head it was um, at our Aldam 120k race, and I remember you know, for me it's quite clear because um, I was around 38, 39 weeks pregnant with Isabella. And the reason why we chose the Aldam venue was it's around three hours, as you know, from Johannesburg. So we were thinking if I'm stressed and I'm running around in boxes and, you know, I always, um, you know, active and never don't pick up boxes scenario. So it was always like if I might go into labor, I will make it back to Joburg, to the hospital. There's enough time. But I can remember clearly this Land Rover pulling in there. And I can remember, remember this branding. <laughs> you know, they look like professionals. <laughs> You've done this before. So it how, like did, it. how did this professional race, uh, you know, how did it go for you guys? Yeah, so... So I was always looking for new adventures, you know, to, to host for, for the people so they can book with us. And I was on the internet and I was searching for some adventure and then this Kinetic Events website popped up. Never heard of you guys before, I think it was 2012. When I that saw you do some 500 kilometer expedition Africa's and I'm like, Dinez, let's do this. I'm going to phone this this lady and I actually emailed you, said, hi, we, we want to inquire. We see this adventure racing thing, 500 kilometers. We want to enter. How do we go about? And then this Heidi lady replies and says, I think you should start with a 25k one maybe. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's super short. I've run like, done like very far the one like this. But anyway, so we entered for the first 25k one and we almost died. <laughs> <laughs> we got lost. We were super tired. It was hectic. So then we decided, okay, maybe she's got a point. And then we entered for the 120, 120 kilometer one, which you just mentioned for Oldham. Yes, we arrived with all our addicted to adventure branding and pop-ups and gazebo and you know, we had the gear, we were looking good, but we, we were in a very inexperienced team. None, it was myself, Tina, my brother, and then another friend of ours who's never done adventure racing. We didn't want to do it with anybody who has any experience in adventure racing because we want to figure this out on our, on our own. Um, yeah, we, then, <laughs> long story short, we ended up doing a 18K hike, took us 11 hours. <laughs> And that before might be the a race, we, <laughs> yeah, it must be a record. Um, I, we didn't take, we didn't do 18 kilometers. We probably did double that. <laughs> and we, uh, when we arrived there, we, we we would put our bikes at the transition, um, as we were told, because I think that was the fourth leg or third leg. I'm not sure. So put our bikes ready with with um, our transition box. Um, we did the race and. Somewhere in the middle of the night, we, we, after we got lost, we got back to transition broken. And the next day, we just put our bike, bikes back on the back on the bucky. <laughs> we didn't even use the bikes. We didn't even have to wash it. So we never even got to the bike leg. So, yeah, totally um, um, I misjudged this race. And, um, yeah, so... All the new guys, it, it happens to everyone. Even the second one, you would think went better. It was even worse, um, <laughs> the second race. So, um, but yeah, we had that fast bait, that stubbornness, you know, just to come back. And uh, Stefan kind of had this way about him to sort of challenge us and to, to come back and prove that we actually can do it. Uh, we're not as, as sissy as, as we don't want. You have to think that no, we can't do it. So, um, yeah, that stubborn, is my, that stubborn um, aspect that probably every adventure racer has made us come back and back and back. And, and now it's eight years later, I think five, six expedition races later. Yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, after that, uh, your first expedition was Swaziland in 2015, correct? Uh, yeah. Swaziland? 
And um, and then again after that, you know, like you said, there's five six expeditions now. But I mean, what is the highlight of Swaziland? What happened there? Yeah. So yeah, your first expedition is usually uh, one of the most memorable ones, because yeah. yeah. You, um, and you never know if you wait. Uh, Stefan actually said it the best way is if you want to wait until you think you're ready or fit enough, or you, then you're never going to do a race. Um, you, you never think you're ready for it. But um, so you learn a lot of things in that first race and all of the races that you, you I mean, you 30, 40 years old, you, you think you know yourself. And after that race, you learn new things about yourself. And for example, uh, on the, just before the last leg, um, Jolene surprised me. Visit, she did a surprise visit. Um, sorry, our dogs are barking outside. Okay. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, on the second last leg, uh, Jolene came through to help us, uh, to, yeah. to come and surprise me, because she wasn't um, uh, joining for the race. Uh, so she um, surprised me at the last transition, and when I saw her, I was so broken, because I had all sorts of injuries, I had serious ITB from the first day. When I saw I I um, cried and and I mean I'm not an emotional person really and for some reason I I cried a bit there when I saw her um, because it probably that's when I saw a little bit of home and a little bit of <laughs> that comfort that that I missed for all the days. Those five oh, days oh, and every oh, step and every hour gets quite long. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it was some, and then the same thing at the finish line as well when I saw her there again. So you, you um, it was obviously uh, there's so many highlights of the race, but especially that was something that you that I experienced that was unique and that I didn't even know about myself. So, oh, that's beautiful. I mean, that's true. You know, like these races bring out always other emotions in you, you know, and that is actually beautiful to discover it. And now we know that every time you cry is when you are so broken, Tina. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I see Jalene is then more often broken than <laughs> or, or, or women in general. <laughs> women in general. I mean, we, we, you know, like cry as part of us, you know. <laughs> Exactly, we're allowed to. <laughs> we're not afraid of it, we just embrace it. Oh, Tina, exactly. Beautiful. <laughs> Tina, is, um, then obviously, I, I mean, it's a mix of emotions. I know I've got another memory. I think, Jolene, you did um, Namako West Coast. I think there you had an accident. If you can briefly tell us what happened there. Um, I remember that as well. Got a call. There was a problem, and I think your whole I mean, you know, you actually had some serious facial injury. <laughs> yes, what happened yes, there, Jolene? Shame, yeah, Shane, poor Tina, um, he always knows that when he's racing with me, there's going to be some sort of challenge for him. Um, I always try and keep it exciting <laughs> for him. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, with Expedition Africa um, in the Macroland, I think it was on day two in the morning, we were going down a hill um, with, our, with our bicycles, and then we were... Actually, your brother was in our team, Gournay, and then another good friend of our, Bayer. Um, and then we were do just going down the hill, and then I just woke up. So I didn't even know why I felt or how I felt, but, but the guys were behind me, and they said that it basically just flew out over my handlebars and um, fell on my face without obviously trying to to cover my face or anything because I didn't even know that was falling. You were sleeping, Gournay. You were taking a nap on a downhill. <laughs> oh, well, I was tired. So. But anyways, you, know, you remember what my face looked like. It was horrible. It was like, a huge, there's still this little bit of a, you know, the yes, skin there. I can, can see, see it. it's white. Yeah. yeah, so there was like a huge hole here and I was blue and swollen and the whole thing. But yeah, we had to, we I, had to go I on. I thought the race was over for us, but she just stuck in until the last day but you don't cycle with your face you cycle with your feet so my face was fine <laughs> but it looked horrible <laughs> so guys with the friends at home listening to these stories i mean now we laugh about it 
when you're in the race, you have to go through it. I mean, the organizers can't always just come and pick you up. And sometimes it's just easier to continue to the next transition and then make decisions. But it's about a cool and calm manner and not to panic. So you guys really have um, like embraced that, you know, like every time things happen, you make a plan. And I think as you're talking about making a plan, there's another story I have to share with our friends at home. In Rodrigues, there's actually two stories, but the, the one, you can see both of them. Tina's, where's your hair? Just show our friends at home that you actually got long hair. And Jolene, show your beautiful long hair. So these two, <laughs> these yeah. two got both. Now it's hair short. But now it's short. Now it's it was, short. It was much longer than this. Their hair was basically as long as mine, as you can see. And these two got a very exciting story of being having an instant haircut on the island of Rodriguez mid-air. What happened? For free. <laughs> yeah, so there, was, there was an app sale from a from a bridge. You, you you go to the middle of the bridge and then you upsell down, not against anything, just so in mid air. And I think we were maybe five or meters from from the bottom. And at some point, a little bit of my hair got stuck in the figure eight where the rope goes through. But remember, there were two. There was two, going yeah. simultaneously, so he was on one rope and I was on the other rope. Yes. So we were two going simultaneously. Yeah. So we were next to each other. So I was also not going down fast, going same speed and sort of just see that the jellings are right. And at some point, um, a little bit of my hair got stuck and, and I luckily pulled it out and I turned towards Jolene and I told her, please just be careful that your hair doesn't get stuck. And as I turned, my hair was going in the figure eight um, and then all of my hair got stuck um so so much that i can't get it out and i was still going down so obviously i wanted to go down and my my head was just going deeper and deeper in and your head deep. wants to go your head wants to go up and you want to go down Ex exactly <laughs> so yeah then i stopped immediately and as that happened jolene tu turned oh. towards me and she had two ponies and one of her ponies went in her figure eight so th <laughs> that happened at exactly the same time both of us he got stuck so now i'm trying to um quite stressed and it it feels like you're you're gonna pull the flesh off of your yeah. off of your head so we're trying to explain to the guys up there um because you've got a safety a second line attached to you to tighten the 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 the, the sort of the safety line and the line that i'm hanging on relax that line so i can get everything uh, my hair out but yeah there was at uh, that moment you realize that your fringe is not very good exactly exactly <laughs> so the guy up there is french <laughs> anyways so with a huge struggle eventually i started shouting in afrikaans so that my teammates can explain to them what to what's happening and a, and a long story short so the guy put his knife in a glove and his glove he attached with a carabiner to the line and he dropped it and it fell on my, my, my bicycle helmet that i had on still got a dent in my bicycle <laughs> helmet took the knife out and cut my hair with a knife but i just have to say how he did that so dennis couldn't see his hair so it was oh. stuck here and he had like the knife here and i was we were like hanging there hanging on for dear life and he was like am i cutting the wrong thing is it my hair is it the wrong <laughs> <laughs> so after he cut his hair it was like swinging like rambo swinging swinging to get to me and then he cut off my hair oh, oh. <laughs> and then both of us could go down and then you had yeah, two, so two pieces of hair with you i remember that yeah, yeah still, still got a photo oh, i got a quick haircut <laughs> quick luckily haircut. my beard didn't get stuck oh wow but that i mean Again, now we laugh about it. That can be a, you know, like it middle it happens at night. If you start panicky, I mean, that can be a serious um, you, a problem. You were super nervous. Yeah, and if you if you if you couldn't, you know, like I said, figure it out, or it's even higher, they could not hear you. I mean, it could go seriously, completely wrong. But but let's start on the positive and, not, and just only speak about the good things. And um, <laughs> it was a great story, and everybody was talking about this instant haircut. And um, 
And next time when you race in a foreign country, you'll get your bonjour, bonjour. You'll get all your <laughs> the right language, <laughs> emergency language words. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, but guys, let's jump from Rodrigues to your other great story of the, in India. I mean, India, you came to our expedition India race in the beautiful Kashmir. We had a fantastic journey from staying on the houseboat on the Dal Lake. Can you remember that? Amazing. Then going to the beautiful Sonamok Mountains and then all the way to Leh. And part of this was the, to acclimatize all the teams because we are going high altitude over the last peak of the race. You had a great race and then on your last leg, you know, things turned for the worse. What happened there? Shania, like I said earlier, I always make it quite challenging for Tina's because it's just not challenging enough. So, <laughs> so yeah, while we were in a, in a very good, cool team, it was uh, one of our friends, very good friends, Bian. I know he's obviously good friends of yours as well. Yeah. And then Marika is also a very dear friend. So the four of us, we were in a team and, and the race went very well. I mean, day one, day two, day three, all went very well. Um, like you obviously know, the altitude was quite high most of the race, um, 3,200 plus, but it was okay, everybody coped and so on. And on the last leg, which was also the hiking leg, um, we had to summit the, what was it, 5,400 or something? about 5,4, yes. 5,4, uh, yes. So when we got to about 4,2, at a transition, I started feeling quite bad. Um, and... Um, just to backtrack, well, obviously at the briefing, Stefan and, and the other guys that um, works there just all, uh, mentioned to us how bad altitude sickness can become and how dangerous it is and that you can actually die from it and we don't, we shouldn't ignore the symptoms and that type of thing. Okay, so yeah, with all that in mind, then obviously we started racing and did the whole race and then on day four at 4,200 above sea level at the transition, and just before that I started feeling quite bad, but you still you know what an adventure racing race is like you it is just another symptom from being tired and being hungry and being a little bit nauseous and yeah, yeah. You, you have to get through it there's, there's nobody's going to feel something for you just get over it type of thing so that that's what we all thought so i was just becoming really i, I couldn't walk straight anymore which is very regular for an adventure racer by day four so dina's put me onto the tow rope and we were walking and so on and then we, we got to the transition had some food, felt a little bit better, and then we went up. So then we had to, went up to get to the testing station. Yeah, the, the camp, um, the like base camp before you can go over the... Yeah, summer. that was at 5,000. Five, five. Five. Actually at five, yeah. just five, two, around there, yeah. Two. yeah. Yes. Just so, before yes, the peak. Obviously, just before the peak, yeah. So we obviously just wanted to get to the station so that they, we could do the testing for oxygen so that they can give us a go to summit. Because obviously... That was about 20 k's from the finish. Yeah. I mean, that was like, yeah. it sounds short, but you know, in adventure racing, 20 k's can be very, very far. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. And at that stage, we were like, we had like, lying in quite a good position at the stage. We were still very positive and excited and whatnot. And then I would say just after that or so, then I started not feeling so good. Um, our friend Vian and um, also started feeling nauseous, had some headaches and so on. And I just was, I was quite short of breath, but you know, you're okay. And then all of a sudden I just asked the guys, can we just sit down a little bit? I, I really don't feel good. And, and it's an awful experience because you don't want to disappoint yeah. your team. Yeah. You don't want to come all this way, be in such a good position. Everybody's doing so well. And now you feel that you're the person preventing them from finishing this, this race. So you've got this internal fight in your head. Jolene, just feel better. Just feel better. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Um, but then we had to sit down and really all of a sudden I just started having like this panic attack type of thing. It was more because I couldn't, I felt that I couldn't breathe really. So I just had this huge panic attack thing. Um, and then we decided, let's turn around. Let's just go down a little bit just to lose some altitude. Maybe we'll feel better and we walk down a little bit. But like you remember, it's not like a steep grab. Uh, you have to go quite far just to lose mm -hmm. a few meters. 
So we had to go, and you know what it's like in an adventure race. You don't want to walk a meter further than that, which you have to because you're tired. And now you're walking backwards. But anyways, um, and then we obviously just we just got to a point where I remember Marika told me, Jolene, only you know what you feel like. You have to tell us. We don't know what you feel like. And then it's then that I re that I really realized, Jolene, you're in trouble now. Um, so we were lying on the ground. And it was becoming dark. I remember Marika holding my hand and said, Jolene, just look at all the stars. And the Himalayas has got the most stars. I know the stars are the same everywhere, but you can see thousands and thousands and thousands of stars in the Himalayas. I remember it so well, and it was such an amazing experience, even under bad circumstances. And then all of a sudden, then I just stopped breathing, like totally, totally stopped breathing. So that was very scary. Tina, you can say what... What you did <laughs> to try and yeah, so so she she stopped breathe, breathing or, or struggled to breathe, um, and then she started pulling her clothes away from her, her throat as if it would help, but because obviously it's just sort of a reaction, and and I've never done CPR or anything, and then I instant uh, instinctively just blew air in her mouth, um, and. After the first blow, she it helped as because obviously I'm forcing oxygen into her lungs. Yeah, she yeah. said it felt, she felt better, but it, it lasts for a few seconds. Then she struggles again. So then I'll blow again, and that we I did in intervals of say 30 seconds for my more than an hour, blowing air in her mouth, and then she feels better, and then she struggles again, and then um, and they were making jokes that we want to. Just kiss. We we want to kiss on the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so that was quite stressful because it look you can see how she's panicking and you don't know what to do. But luckily it helped, and um, we we set up tent tent because it's cold as well. So we were setting up tent um, just to spend the night. And I'm sure Stefan was everyone you as well was stressing because yeah. you on the on the on the GPS tracker. We're not moving up, we're not moving down, is something wrong, what's going I on? I know, I was sitting at the finishing line, of course, waiting for the teams, and we have the, we had internet at the hotel, and Stefan and them had very limited internet, and Stefan at that point started moving up to that base camp, um, and, and you know, we, we had a satellite phone, and the only way we could communicate, no, they're not going up, now they're going down, and then we knew, we knew there's problems. Um, and, and then Stefan just kept on asking, but how fast are they moving? And then we also could see that you are moving too slow. So, you know, you try to figure out the whole time from an organizer, um, okay, now they are coming down, but are they okay? Um, okay, but now they're stopping again. So, you, you, I mean, uh, do no. they have, can they walk? Can they not walk? Okay, they haven't reached the top camp. So, you're basically between the two camps. So, must we just wait for you? Are you coming? Are you... And I mean, no. I think at some point, of course, Stephen started walking up to come and fetch you guys or look for you guys. Um, but I mean, everybody yes. who's at home, I think, just need to understand the situation. This is like at, at um, you know, like nearly 5,000 meters high up in the mountains. This is not, I mean, for anybody who's climbed mountains will know that this is like nearly as high as Kilimanjaro. This, this is, is not a matter of, yeah. you know, if people just understand, it is not a matter of you just walk and go and find something. I mean, uh, it, you just walk down. I mean, the time we're talking about here, yeah, I mean, it is, you know, to find anybody, it's seven, eight, nine hours. I mean, it, uh, just to understand how big it is. I mean, just from that base camp to go drive all the way around and over the bus to the finishing line is like nearly 20 hours. Mm. Um, and, and the magnitude of what we're dealing with. So, I mean, we knew that there's problems um, and then eventually, um, uh, Stefan had his own problems at base camp because we had obviously medics and helpers there, but they refused to walk up the mountain. And eventually, obviously, he had to come and start carrying, walking up and oxygen to some teams and whatever. But anyway, but that is, is a, that's a story on another discussion. But, yeah. but, but, but eventually, the interesting came thing down. on the mountain is we wanted to make a fire because it was so cold, but our lighter couldn't didn't work, and we thought oh. it's a dart. But when you got down after the race, we tested it's working perfectly. It shows you there's so there's not enough oxygen, oxygen up there, and you can't get a fire going. And when we were 
back at about three and there i think is three thousand three thousand two hundred yeah the light is perfect there's much more oxygen so um just that test of trying to light the match or your lighter it uh, it shows you how there's a lack of oxygen up there you mm -hmm. can't even light anything yeah yeah but guys, I mean, Jolene, how do you feel? I mean, obviously, all these stories and these ventures. I mean, how, how, I mean, how was the Himalayas for you, despite of all of that? Well, Heidi, every adventure race is such an amazing experience, and you learn so much from everyone. Or for, and the thing is, you go through these bad stuff, but you just you come out so empowered afterwards. Um, even if you just if you learn something or you met someone or you could tell someone what happened so that they can learn something from it um just on again on a personal note with regards to this whole situation of me not having any oxygen and where i couldn't breathe um it's it's strange because you get to a point where you realize this this might be it this is your last day on earth um and I think that was the only time in my life, really, that I got that close to thinking that I'm not going to live for another hour or, I don't know, five minutes or whatever. And what is amazing is just how content I felt with the whole situation. I felt that I'm not afraid to go. I'm not afraid to die. Um, um, while I was really thinking I was dying, I still had this sense of humor inside me thinking, well, at least I'm dying in the beautiful Himalayas and not in the ugly <gasps> Boxburg where I'm staying. So <laughs> Please don't do that to any race organizer, okay? I'm going to refuse certain races in the future because, that, Jolene, you just stay home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's just amazing how you can feel that you're okay. The thing is just Tina's obviously decided against that and he decided he was not going to let me go and he was no. going in a with huge eyes like this, just blowing and blowing and blowing and blowing. And then obviously the rest of the team kept me quite warm throughout the night when we stayed over in the tent, um, because obviously it was really, really cold. And then unfortunately, like I said um, earlier, you, you don't want to be that one in the team that that yeah. makes, that does that, that you don't can't finish. So unfortunately the whole team had to turn around, go back to base camp where te uh, Stefan met with us. And then from there he had to take us around the mountain and then we could you know still walk through the finish at least line, you so. could still walk through le main square town and i could give you a hug at the finishing oh. line and the pizzas <laughs> and the pizza and it doesn't matter how much of the route you've done you've done 80 percent more 90 percent of the whole experience and you still deserve yes. for that to walk through the finishing line yeah no that was amazing and india is one of the most beautiful places on earth especially the himalayas yeah oh thanks guys yeah i mean i think tina you've you've pushed on a few pointers and jolene and i mean for our friends at home just listening to these stories i think what you can take from there is yeah maybe you need to be stubborn and want to prove that you can do this and and if you have that nature and determination you have a natural instinct to say, I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm going to try again. I'm going to improve myself and I'm going to get better. And every time you come back and you just make more experiences. And even if it's not great experience, like things go wrong, I mean, look at what we're talking afterwards. We're not talking only about the good stuff. We're talking about the exactly. good experience. These are the things that like fulfill us and, and give us, like you say, it empowers you because it actually shows you to, so how much more you can do the power of the exactly. mind and, and 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 this and that is why we love adventure racing i think and we're such a great family and um it's wonderful to have these stories uh sharing with you guys and um Venus and jolene so what is next are we are we um, getting excited for the situ i know um Tina, you are, you said you um racing for a team the situ jolene may be racing maybe team media is that on the car are you getting ready yeah, we, we, we're very excited for Lesotho and a little bit scared as well, because Lesotho is also mountains and it's cold. Um, we, 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 um, the day that we were supposed to start, I think it was snowing in Lesotho. 
So, yeah, that's quite scary being in the middle of the night on a mountain, super cold. So, yeah, very excited. That's obviously the next plan that's now moved to next year. But also, you know the Appy Ski Resort very well because you are actually, well, it's one of your tours, your trips. You take um, normally every year a group of people to go and ski at Appy Ski. So, I mean, just that pocket, of course. But, I mean, that's it. Oh, that is, yeah. You know, you know. Yeah, it it gives us an advantage. <laughs> We, we know that the rain. For the last hundred meters of the rain. <laughs> <laughs> no, you will not have to get the fastest into the finishing line. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it could win us a position. <laughs> oh, you guys. Yeah, um, we've been taking uh, people to Apri Ski for the last seven years, every year, because it is such an amazing experience and it's literally on our doorstep. I mean, being in South Africa, there's not really a place to ski here. So Lesotho mm -hmm. Afri Ski is just most amazing place to take South Africans who hadn't seen snow. So that is a very special place. I think for us South but Africans yeah. and um, you know, for us South Africans and not our European, um, you know, yeah, maybe not for our European skiers and experts. I mean, but for us, it's wonderful to have such a resort and can give us a few months of the uh, snow and you can go and play and. Just improve your skiing skills, you know. Um, and it's also in summer months, beautiful. Like now, we're using the event, uh, the, the venue not for skiing purposes, but just the, the greenery in the mountains and the scenery is magnificent. Yes. Yeah, but it, as you guys expose us to all these awesome places you would never see, uh, now we're going to see the surrounding areas as well. Yeah. And and though there, you're going to go there where no tourists are going. So. So we're super excited for this too, too, and I hope you as well. And um, don't be scared, like you, like you said, Tina, um, what Stefan always said, and that is very important. If you're always going to think you'll be ready next year or the year after that, it's never going to happen. You just need mm -hmm. to do it. You just need to do Thank it. It doesn't matter if you do 200 kilometers of a 500k race, but if, if you really want to try a bench race, then you just need to race. Exactly. And there's so many things that can go wrong. Um, just getting to the starting line um, with a lot of our other races, it's, it's super uh, difficult. Just our Rodrigue race, um, I think a month before, we were sitting with uh, we're still needing two team members. Yeah. One of our team members uh, broke his, his wrist and we had to basically beg someone to, and to borrow money to buy a plane ticket <laughs> to do the race and pay it off over time. Um, we wasn't really trained uh, in, the, in the perfect uh, um, fitness to do the race. Um, that's just leading up to the race. And then in the actual race, there's 10, like, you know, hundreds of obstacles um, to get to the finish line. So, um, But it makes it all worth it. Yeah, it makes but it worth you it. guys with your long hair and you look like a real Captain Hook on that sailing ship. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And um, I know you guys do lots of diving. You were like fishes in that water. Before I close down, I just want to tell the last story to our friends at home that there's the most beautiful clip of this couple. They were swimming um, on the on their backs and one of the legs where you you know we call it island hopping. So you had to swim from the one island to the next island. And the um, elevated adventure films got that shot. Simon was flying with his drone over you, Jolene. And we actually used it in one of our um, the daily edits. And as the drone flew over her, she was just like a fish in the water, you know, like a mermaid, like a dolphin, whatever you want to call it. She was lying and she showed us a heart <laughs> up in the sky. And the best part is, which I only heard later, Tina's was swimming like let's say 100 meters away, you know, further. And when the drone flew over him, he did exactly the same. <laughs> guys, I mean, you two are incredible and we love you. And uh, oh, we, we did that for you, Heidi. Oh, you taught us oh, it's all about love. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm, I'm so happy if you can feel it and um, that you're part of our family. And uh, thank you for being stubborn and keep on coming back to the plane cave. <laughs> yeah, you have to organize at least five more so I can make my, do, do my 10th expedition with you. Uh, I'll have to. God willing, I, I will try our best, you know, so we can get you to your tent. And you know, that one is for free, hey? 
Exactly. Number 10 is a free race. <laughs> yes. Okay, guys. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your your beautiful story with us. Um, Thanks for having us. And um, I can't wait until lockdown we can have a bride. Oh, Heidi. Yes, please. Can we please go and have it in the mountains? I, the mountains are calling me so why hard. Don't you come, why don't you come and you come and scout with us, you know, in the suit too? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. But don't take photos. Do, yeah, we go and do some wild camping and we do some bride. Oh, can't wait. Yes. You can do the bride for us. I can't wait. And uh, who's going to carry you the bride? Hey? <laughs> who's going to carry you the bride? Stefan, Stefan. Stefan, yeah, 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 that's good. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> bye, Thank bye, you. bye. Thanks, Heidi. God bless Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Bye. <laughs> bye, Heidi.